بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أهلا ومرحبا بحضراتكم في الجلسة الثالثة من جلسات مؤتمرنا الموسوم بالمخطوطات بالحرف العربي في إفريقيا يسعدني أن أقدم للجلسة الثالثة التي ترأسها بروفيسور بانج وهذه الجلسة سوف تكون مختصة باللغات الإفريقية التي تكتب بالحرف العربي أولاً دعوني أرحب برئيسة الجلسة بروفيسور بانج بروفيسور بانج أستاذ التاريخ بقسم الآثار والتاريخ والدراسات الثقافية والأديان جامعة بيوجين بالنرويج تنصب اهتمامات بروفيسور بانج البحثية على التاريخ الإسلامي للمحيط الهندي الغربي في القرنين التاسع عشر والعشرين وتشمل اهتماماتها اليمن وعمان وكينيا وتنزانيا وموزمبيق وتتركز كذلك أعمالها على الأنماط المتنوعة للتغير الديني من خلال تداول النصوص والكتب وإصلاح ممارسات الطقوس والتعليم وتشتمل أيضا على التغير الاجتماعي والقانوني والسياسي اعتمادا بشكل أساسي على المصادر العربية جنبا إلى جنب مع العمل الميداني نفذت بروفيسور بانج مشروعات كثيرة لرقمنة وصيانة المخطوطات والنصوص ذات الملكية الخاصة والمعرضة لخطر التدهور البيئي مثل مخطوطات مسجد رياض في لامو في كينيا وقد اطلع هذا المشروع برقمنة مجموعة المخطوطات المحفوظة بمسجد رياض بلامو في كينيا وقد أسس معهد مسجد رياض في أواخر القرن التاسع عشر وهو يعد واحدا من أقدم المؤسسات التعليمية الإسلامية الدائمة في شرق إفريقيا وتتكون المجموعة المرقمنة من 145 عنصرا يرجع تاريخها إلى القرنين التاسع عشر والعشرين في هذه الجلسة نشرف بوجود أسماء لباحثين كبار كلهم متخصصون في مجالاتهم معنا في هذه الجلسة دكتور سيمي موني معنا كذلك دكتور ديميتري كذلك نرحب بدكتور محمد وأخيرا دكتور أميدو ساني ونتمنى أن تكون هذه الجلسة برئاسة بروفيسور بانج قادرة على الإجابة عن تساؤلات كثير من المتابعين والتي تصلنا عن طريق المواقع المختلفة وكلها تنصب حول مصلة بين اللغات الإفريقية والحرف العربي ومتى بدأت هذه الصلة وما هي الأشكال المختلفة للحوار الذي دار بين الأحرف العربية واللغات الإفريقية مرة أخرى أرحب ببروفيسور بانج وأدعوها إلى بدء هذه الجلسة فلتتفضل Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mehdet Issa. Thank you again to the organizers. And uh, I, I would like to take the time to extend a special thanks also to the translators who are behind the scene and uh, who, who work tirelessly throughout this conference. Uh, I'm going to moderate this panel, which is the third panel, where as uh, the director stated the topic of today is Arabic script for languages other than Arabic. Uh, and in this panel, we will hear uh, presentations on several different uh, languages, including as far as I could gather, Kanembu, Pular, Fulani, Yoruba, and perhaps others. 
and we will be introduced also to different types of texts. I just want to say first that there will be a Q&A session towards the end of after all the four presentations. Participants can write their questions in the chat and they will be relayed uh, and directed to the presenters. I will maybe try to even it out if there are uh, uh, many questions for one, I will still try to raise questions for each, uh, each panelist. Then I would also like the panelists to do two quite contradictory things. Uh, first, try to stick to their 20 minutes and at the same time trying to speak a bit slowly uh, in order to assist the translators. Uh, so without further ado, I am very honored to introduce uh, our first and uh, keynote speaker, Professor Sani Mumuni. Uh, Professor Mumuni is a director of the Institute of Research uh, in the Human Sciences at Abdu Mumuni University in Niamey in Niger and the research director in civilizations and history of ideas of the Conseil Africain et Malagache pour l'enseignement supérieur and a specialist in sub-Saharan manuscripts and uh, Islam. Professor Mumuni is also the coordinator of the prospecting, acquisition, preservation and valuation of ancient manuscripts in Niger. Uh, this is a project, and he's also a corresponding member of the UNESCO Subcommission on Education and Research, and an affiliated member of the International Academic Union, and an expert on the African and Malagash Con Council for Higher Education. He has published very widely. Uh, I will uh, quote just a few of his publications. The Histoire de Cinder, Le Manuscript de la Vallée du Fleuve Niger and Le Ton de Oulama, Le Manuscript Africain comme Source Historique, uh, and uh, another work on uh, La Vie et Oeuvre du Cheikh Osman Dan Fodio, and also on uh, l'Islam au Sufisme. Uh, what we will hear today is his keynote speech on tracing the history of handwritten traditions in Africa. Uh, S'il vous plaît, Professeur uh, Moumouni, la parole est à vous. Merci beaucoup. Uh, donc, je vais essayer de partager um, ma présentation. Bon, j'espère que la technologie va nous aider. Ok, c'est bon. Donc, merci beaucoup, Anne Beng, pour la présentation. Donc, le thème que je proposais d'aborder dans, dans ce panel est la tradition manuscrite en Afrique. Et là, je dis en Afrique, mais il faut considérer que euh, ce que je vais aborder concerne surtout l'Afrique de l'Ouest. On sait très bien qu'en Afrique du Nord, il y a des collections de manuscrits que je ne vais pas aborder ici. Et également, en Afrique de l'Est, également, il y a des manuscrits et dans le, notre... Euh, le mode, la modératrice et spécialiste. Voilà, donc, euh, euh, par rapport à ce thème, euh, il faut considérer que l'écriture euh, est une donnée fondamentale des civilisations humaines 
et que l'homme a toujours cherché à conserver la parole à travers des graphismes, des signes ou des lettres, ou des lettres qui représentent les sons ou les idées. Et donc, l'envie d'écrire fait partie du de, de processus hein, de, de recherche de connaissances de toutes les civilisations humaines. Et cette, en Afrique, nous avons, à travers cette conception de l'écriture, la tradition manuscrite, une tradition manuscrite, par rapport à, en rapport à, avec cette tradition manuscrite, bien sûr, il y en a eu d'autres traditions manuscrites que je ne vais pas aborder ici, mais ce qui concerne les manuscrits en langue arabe et en écriture euh, à Yami, par exemple, ce, ce type, cette tradition manuscrite est intimement liée à l'expansion de l'islam et du commerce transsaharien. Donc, le, le, historien, dans les travaux historiques, remonte le, ce contact, ce contact hein, vers le 9e siècle avec, bien sûr, les, les caravanes transsahariennes qui régulent la savane au Maghreb et au Proche-Orient. Il y a également le commerce caravanier et l'arrivée de l'islam qui ont provoqué une transformation sociale, culturelle et politique des sociétés africaines et tout particulièrement des sociétés ouest-africaines. Durant des siècles, il y a eu dans cet espace une immense tradition manuscrite qui s'est mise en place. Et les, les, les centres historiques qui, en tout cas, qui montrent, qui symbolisent cette tradition manuscrite, comme vous le savez, et c'est bien sûr, il y a Tombouctou à travers les monuments historiques que nous avons actuellement à Tombouctou, comme la mosquée d'Ingarebe, et il y a également un peu partout dans cette zone à Djenné, par exemple, toujours au Mali, il y a Gao, donc. Et par en rapport avec cette culture manuscrite, il y a eu des grands centres historiques, hein, en tout cas, et participé à la production de cette tradition manuscrite. Nous avons également au, au Niger, à Gadez, et également en Mauritanie, avec bien sûr la mosquée de Kingiti, tous ces, ces grands centres, euh, ces, mosquées, hein, ces mosquées ont joué un rôle très, très important dans l'accumulation et la production des, des manuscrits. Nous avons toujours à Tombouctou euh, la mosquée Sankore, hein, qui est un lieu de culte et de transmission du savoir, donc où, euh, bien sûr, à, à travers plusieurs euh, travaux, des, 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 plusieurs euh, ouvrages, hein, des œuvres ont montré comment euh, ces lieux, ces centres ont joué ce rôle de transmission et de, de, du savoir et à travers qui, par la suite, est, est, est disséminé un peu partout en, en Afrique et à travers le monde. Et alors, ces, ces manuscrits anciens, on les trouve un peu partout, dans, pratiquement dans tous les pays ouest-africains. Le nombre et l'importance des manuscrits varient d'un pays à un autre. Un pays comme la Mauritanie, le Mali, le Nigeria et le Niger représentent le, le, le berceau. Je vais ajouter le Sénégal, hein, le berceau de cette tradition manuscrite. Parce que bien entendu, comme je l'ai dit au départ, il ne s'agit que de l'Afrique de l'Ouest. Alors, ces collections euh, de manuscrits, il y a eu des témoignages hein, de, de, des auteurs voyageurs qui ont témoigné par, par leurs écrits hein, de, de l'importance de, 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 de ce patrimoine culturel, scientifique et de, aussi de la vie intellectuelle hein, qui animait ces cités, ces cités historiques. Nous avons par exemple Léon Jean l'Africain qui qui a parlé longuement, qui a évoqué cette tradition manuscrite à travers son ouvrage sur la description de l'Afrique. Alors, ces manuscrits, comme vous le savez, comme ça a été dit, parce qu'il faut aussi dire que ce que je dis là, hier, il y a eu dans les présentations pas mal des éléments qui, qui, 
qui vont dans le sens de ce que je vais dire, hein, parce qu'il y a eu une bonne introduction à travers les, 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 les conférences de, des éminents chercheurs et scientifiques sur les, sur les manuscrits et sur l'importance des manuscrits. Alors là, la typologie, bon, comme vous le savez, il existe deux types de manuscrits. Dans les collections, on sait qu'on trouve en Afrique de l'Ouest, hein, on trouve des manuscrits en langue et écriture arabe, mais également des manuscrits qui sont dans des langues africaines. Donc l'objet de, de ce, 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 ce panel, parce que ce panel est consacré et sur, aux manuscrits en, en langue africaine. Alors, cette tradition manuscrite africaine, comme toute tradition manuscrite, s'appuie sur l'enseignement de l'écriture sacrée. Elle a eu pour conséquence l'invention d'autres formes de communication, telles que l'écriture de certaines langues jusqu'alors orales. On trouve en Afrique des manuscrits en langue écriture arabe et des manuscrits en langue africaine, comme Hossa, Fouchoudé, Kanori, Tamajek, Souheli, Olof, etc., etc. Et donc, certains de ces manuscrits font l'objet d'une présentation dans ce panel. Hier également, on en a parlé par rapport à, aux publications du professeur Hilmi Sharawi sur les langues, les, sur les manuscrits à Diamé. Alors, cette euh, tradition manuscrite a connu deux étapes importantes. La première étape concernait la mise en place les bibliothèques des sources islamiques par la reproduction des grands recueils islamiques tels que le Coran, la Sunna prophétique, les hadiths, les chroniques et les grands traités juridiques et mystiques. Ensuite, la seconde étape fut marquée par la participation massive des auteurs locaux et la création littéraire et à l'institutionnalisation de l'enseignement dans les grands centres historiques. Par exemple, hier, avec la présentation de Daria, nous avons vu le l'importance hein, de la transmission et de l'enseignement, le rôle de l'enseignement, hein, de l'éducation islamique dans la production de ce manuscrit et dans la constitution de cette tradition manuscrite. Alors, j'ai essayé dans la, à partir de la collection de Niamey de, faire une, de dresser une typologie de l'évolution chronologique des manuscrits hein, à partir des dates. Hein, donc, nous, nous avons trouvé que de, de, certains, les manuscrits qui datent hein, de, 700, de 700 à 1099, sont, on les a classés comme des manuscrits classiques, et puis également les manuscrits de 1100 à, 15, à 1599 sont des récits des voyageurs arabes, notamment Ibn Battuta, Ibn Haldun, etc. Et également les manuscrits de 1600 à, à 2000 hein, sont des manuscrits souvent écrit par des auteurs africains. Alors ici, nous avons une, euh, euh, un exemple hein, de manuscrit en langue arabe, parce qu'il faut aussi dire qu'un euh, bon nombre, ça dépend des collections en tout cas, mais la plupart des collections que j'ai eu à, à visiter, c'est les manuscrits en langue arabe qui représentent euh, la majorité des, des, des collections. Et également, nous avons des manuscrits en langue arabe. Alors, euh, il faut aussi dire que l'une des particularités des manuscrits euh, qu'on trouve dans l'Afrique subsaharienne euh, le, se trouve au niveau de, 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 de la forme, sous la, la forme en folio, hein, séparé et non relié, l'absence de relure hein, de, de, ces, de ces manuscrits. Donc, les folios sont retenus dans l'ordre par des réclames. En bas des pages, les mots devront figurer au début de la page suivante. Hein? L'absence de relure indique la mobilité des manuscrits qui passent d'une main à une autre. On peut constater cela au cours des séances d'enseignement et de lecture publique. Les feuilles sont souvent partagées entre étudiants suivant le même niveau d'études. Cependant, cette fragmentation, le fait que les manuscrits ne soient pas reliés, et permet de partager les livres manuscrits entre plusieurs. Donc, c'est aller plutôt dans le sens de partager le, le, le manuscrit, le savoir, le partage du savoir. Et donc, et également pour que un seul livre manuscrit soit euh, euh, utilisé par 
plusieurs personnes au même moment. Et par exemple, ici, nous avons une séance de lecture collective hein, de manuscrits. On a vu, vous voyez, les, les manuscrits euh, sont un peu euh, éparpillés et qui passent d'une main à une autre. Également, nous avons, bon, je, je, c'est juste une présentation des manuscrits en langue fouldée. Hein, c'est que nous venons de parler euh, également euh, en langue germain, également en Jula. Hein, ça, c'est, c'est, c'est représentatif pour montrer qu'il y a des manuscrits qui sont aussi dans d'autres langues africaines et qui, ont, et qui font en tout cas le, la richesse hein, de ces collections. Alors, l'identification, l'authentication, alors, le catalogue, bien sûr, comme toute collection, les, les collections les, les manuscrits en Afrique euh, euh, sont catalogués. Hein, vous savez très bien que les catalogues est un instrument indispensable pour l'identification et l'accessibilité des collections. Il y a un bon nombre de collections qui sont cataloguées. Alors, le catalogue permet de localiser et identifier les manuscrits en les rendant accessibles, accessibles pardon, aux chercheurs. Une collection non cataloguée est une collection qui n'existe pas et qui sera difficile à être protégée et valorisée. En tout cas, il y a une bonne... La promotion, en tout cas, euh, du catalogage, d'aller vers le catalogage pour une meilleure valorisation des collections des manuscrits à l'Afrique de l'Ouest. Également, bon, il y a une fiche analytique depuis quelques années. Alors, donc, les catalogages, les normes de catalogage adoptées sont, 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 sont en rapport, en tout cas, avec tout ce qui s'est fait un peu partout dans le monde, et notamment et avec la, la Fondation Alfrican, qui a catalogué un bon nombre de collections de manuscrits de l'Afrique de l'Ouest. Ici, nous avons les catalogues, exemple des catalogues de, des collections des manuscrits du, du Niger, à Niamey, à l'Institut de recherche des sciences humaines de Niamey. Alors, il faut que j'aille un peu plus vite. Et également, comme on parle de catalogues, il faut aussi dire, dire qu'il y a aussi le catalogue du John Anouk, hein, le grand catalogue qui recense euh, euh, toutes les collections, hein, un bon nombre de collections de, de l'Afrique, mais aussi au-delà, enfin de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, mais également de, de l'Afrique de l'Est, euh, qui est vraiment un instrument de travail très, très important, très intéressant. Exemple de catalogue. Alors, les manuscrits comme support de ça et non comme objet sacralisé, il faut aussi dire que c'est très important que ces manuscrits sont sont des instruments, enfin, instruments, sont des, vraiment des documents de, 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 de travail, de, de lecture et, de, et pas seulement des objets sacra, sacralisés. Bien entendu, il y en a, il y en a, on a parlé, un bon nombre qui, qui sont des manuscrits religieux, mais également, il y a des manuscrits historiques, généalogiques, etc., de, qui parlent d'autres sociologies, etc., et donc, qui sont très souvent, les, les savants, les oulémas, euh, font appel, euh, lisent ces manuscrits-là. Euh, et donc, il euh, y a également les manuscrits euh, euh, sciences de lecture, il faut que j'aille un peu plus vite pour respecter le temps. Et, alors, les juridus ont toujours apporté un soin particulier à l'accumulation des livres manuscrits en dépensant ce qu'ils avaient de plus précieux pour en acquérir soit par achat, soit par copie, comme une copie de manuscrits. Alors l'écriture, nous avons plusieurs euh, formes d'écriture et, et le temps ne me permettra pas de, d'aborder, vous avez ce qu'on appelle les écritures orientales, hein, les formes d'écriture euh, qui, qu'on trouve souvent sous différents, différents styles tels que Koufik, Nosei, les Soulos, les diwans, les rita et les personnes. Et donc, il arrive de trouver ces, ces formes d'écriture. Également, on, on en trouve souvent, en tout cas dans beaucoup de collections, on parle souvent de l'écriture maghrébine et, et ce qu'on appelle euh, l'écriture venue du Maghreb et répandue dans toute l'Afrique et en Espagne musulmane et qui offre une grande variété de formes. 
Donc, il faut s'en tenir à cette variété de formes de, de culture qu'on trouve dans les collections des manuscrits dans notre espace. Il y a vraiment une variété de formes. Alors, je voudrais vous parler un peu aussi des centres de conservation et de sécurisation des manuscrits. Alors, euh, vous savez, un nombre important de fonds sont encore dans une phase d'inventaire, si bien qu'il y a eu beaucoup de fonds qui ont été fournis hein, pour la centralisation et la préservation des manuscrits. Par exemple, nous avons le centre Ahmad Baba, hein, qui est maintenant un institut de hautes études islamiques et qui a un rôle très, très important. Alors, c'est les centres qui ont été installés dans les années 60, hein, euh, ça a permis aux chercheurs hein, de contribuer à la gestion des dépôts des manuscrits. Et donc, certains, centres, certains chercheurs ont encouragé les traductions des chroniques hein, et d'autres ont mené une campagne d'acquisition de reprographie et le microfumage de nouveaux manuscrits de valeur inestimable. Donc, il y a eu vraiment par le passé un effort important de qui va dans le sens de création des centres de conservation. Et à partir de là, nous avons vu, dans, à, à partir de ces mouvements, la création du département des manuscrits hein, de Niamey, qui a été créé par Abu Bouhama, et également le, la création de, de la collection des manuscrits de l'Institut des études africaines du, du Ghana, euh, le, le département des manuscrits de l'Université d'Ibada, etc. On en a eu un peu partout et également, bien sûr, et certainement le collègue du Sénégal va nous en parler, de, également la constitution de la collè collection des manuscrits de l'IFA à Dakar. Alors, les, il y a des bibliothèques, il faut considérer que dans la gestion des manuscrits, nous avons deux types d'institutions, de, ce qu'on appelle les bibliothèques publiques, mais également il y a des bibliothèques privées qu'il ne faut pas Oublié. Donc, euh, les bibliothèques privées jouent un rôle très, très important aussi dans la conservation et la, et la euh, diffusion des, des manuscrits. Alors, parmi les bibliothèques publiques, euh, je ne sais pas le temps, donc, notons que ce que je viens de dire, hein, le Centre Amad Baba, euh, les collections de l'Institut de recherche à Niamey, la collection de la bibliothèque de l'IFA chez Kentagio, et au Nigeria, dans pratiquement les grandes villes du Nord, nous avons des collections de manuscrits et également le grand centre Arewa House hein, qui joue un rôle très, très important dans la collection des manuscrits. On trouve également des manuscrits euh, subsahariens ou africains un peu partout dans, en Europe, euh, en Bretagne, en France, un peu partout aux États-Unis. Euh, et donc, ces manuscrits, on les trouve également en Allemagne, le, le grand centre d'Ami euh, qui est devenu aujourd'hui une référence dans l'étude des manuscrits à Jami. Et donc, ce, ces centres jouent un rôle très, très important dans la conservation et la valorisation des, des, des manuscrits. Alors, ici, nous avons une, une image hein, du de, de fond des manuscrits du de, département de, de Niamey, des manuscrits de Niamey. Et ça, c'est une vieille image de la bibliothèque euh, Ahmad Baba avant les événements hein, de Tombouctou. Alors, ces, ces, ces centres de conservation euh, ont joué un rôle très, très important. Alors, parmi leurs missions, il y a la recension, collecte et sauvegarde euh, des manuscrits, la sécurisation des collections par la numérisation, l'organisation des ateliers et séminaires, Etc., etc. Donc, c'est une sensibilisation des détenteurs des manuscrits. May, may I just de... interrupt very briefly before you go on, just to say that you have now passed the 20 minutes? Ah, d'accord. Je suis, je suis désolé. Je, je, je conclue. Alors, donc, euh, je vous remercie pour le rappel. Alors, ce patrimoine universel, comme vous le savez, est menacé hein, aujourd'hui par plusieurs facteurs, parmi lesquels... Please, please bien sûr, uh, make your conclusion, no problem. Et donc, euh, euh, l'environnement, les catastrophes naturelles, mais aussi l'insécurité. 
Aujourd'hui, dans vous plaît, la faire, zone... faire votre conclusion. Ça, ça va je suis dans la conclusion. Ah, Merci bien. beaucoup. Je suis en train de conclure. Et donc, c'est vraiment ce patrimoine est aujourd'hui menacé. Surtout euh, si on prend la zone du Sahel, hein, non seulement par les, les facteurs hein, traditionnels qui menacent les manuscrits, notamment les climats, les facteurs environnementaux, les catastrophes naturelles. Et il faut ajouter à cela aussi l'insécurité hein, qui, qui pousse les gens à se déplacer et très souvent à, à laisser les manuscrits et, et dans des conditions difficiles. Voilà, donc euh, je vous remercie beaucoup. Euh, je m'arrête là. Merci. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor Mumuni, for this uh, overview of all the types uh, of languages and writing styles and the conservation and research efforts in, in a wide range of collections and, and libraries. Uh, this is a very good start for, for moving on. Uh, and I am really pleased uh, to introduce uh, as the second speaker of this panel, uh, Dr. Dimitri Bondarev, uh, who is the head of uh, the West Africa projects at the Center for the Study of Manuscript Cultures at the University of Hamburg in uh, Germany. Uh, he used to work uh, at the School of Oriental and African Studies, uh, University of London, uh, and has been investigating annotations of early Nigerian Quranic manuscripts. Uh, his research interests cover African linguistics, being uh, Saharan, Chadic, and Manda languages, literacy studies, especially in the context of Islamic uh, ex exegetical traditions uh, in African languages, uh, the history of writing in Arabic-based uh, scripts, uh, that is, Ajami, and the paleography and codicology of West African manuscripts. Uh, Dmitry Bondarev has published very extensively on, on these topics, which he also develops uh, in his teaching at the uh, University of Hamburg, uh, in addition to the extensive studies conducted by his international team of scholars uh, on the Ajami manuscripts of Sahelian Africa. We are looking forward to hear uh, your presentation on the connecting power of grammar. The floor is yours, Dmitry. Uh, thank you very much, Anna, for uh, introducing me. Can you uh, can you see my uh, PowerPoint, the full screen without my notes? We can see it clearly. Good, and I assume you can see hear me well. Absolutely. Good. Well, thanks very much again, and for to the organizers, I will reiterate uh, all these praises to the simultaneous interpreters and uh, for the organizers for this uh, very uh, thought-provoking, inspiring uh, conference. So let me uh, start uh, with the uh, my presentation. Uh, it will be two parts, and uh, one uh, will introduce you to the to what uh, uh, I call Old Kanembu and Tarjimur languages and the other part will uh, be about the influence of these two particular languages onto a poetic register uh, that we only recently found some traces of this register only recently found in, in Ajami poetry. Uh, as uh, you all know uh, the uh, Islam in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has uh, long roots and uh, in these 1200 years of Islam in, in this uh, vast region, uh, Kanem-Borno Sultanate or Kanem-Borno Empire as it is known, uh, became exposed to Islam about the 11th uh, century. Uh, in today's uh, material, I will presenting. Uh, I will be presenting uh, to you. Uh, we will be uh, around this uh, geographical region of uh, Lake uh, Chad. Um, on this historical diagram, uh, you can see um, a map that represents a. Uh, 
um, historical dimension of the development of uh, Kahnem and Borno. So Kahnem started off uh, 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 with the Saifava dynasty, so-called Saifava ruling dynasty. And uh, along the um, 15th century, around that time, the uh, Saifava rulers who spoke a language called Kanembu uh, were moving, can you see my cursor in here? Yeah, so they were moving uh, to the Eastern part of uh, Lake Chad. And with them, they brought the language, uh, Kanembu. They also brought the uh, scholars, Islamic scholars with them. And uh, they established uh, in 1480s, they established a capital uh, of the newly, uh, new Borno province, uh, Gazar Gamu. Now, subsequent history of Borno can roughly be schematized along this timeline. Starting from the 15th century, Borno was a leading Islamic uh, polity in the region of Lake Chad. It controlled vast lands of what is now Northeast Nigeria, Southeast Niger and West Chad. The 17th to 16th to the 17th century, were a time of the uh, dominance and apex of uh, Borno in the uh, larger region. Uh, beginning from the 13th century, however, uh, there were various changes prompted, especially prompted by the Fulani Jihad uh, and the establishment of uh, uh, the Sokoto Caliphate in the west, west of, the, of Borno. Uh, and at that time, the capital city, Gazargamu, was abandoned. The ruling Saifava dynasty fell, and the new dynasty of uh, Sheikh rulers started off with uh, Sheikh Muhammad uh, uh, al kanimi uh, depicted here. And more disastrous years followed in 1893, 1900. Uh, the Sudanese warlord Rabi al Zubair controlled Borno. And then it was killed by the colonial, by the French. And after that, uh, uh, in colonial, post-colonial times, Borno became a distinct province. And it is now one of the states of Nigeria. So uh, what happened along these historical events uh, in terms of the use of language that became uh, known as Old Kanembu? Well, uh, it is one of the earliest written evidence uh, of uh, the Sahelian, of the languages of the Sahelian Africa. And it was used in the Quran manuscripts produced between the 17th and the early 19th centuries. Uh, sometime around the first quarter of the ninth century, old Kanembu uh, that was used here in these manuscripts between the lines uh, in the Quran manuscripts, uh, ceased being used in the Quranic manuscripts, but uh, continued. So you can see on this picture that there is no commentaries on the Quran, or late versions of the Quran, Mus'haf, uh, but it continued, the Old Kanembu language continued to be used in the annotations in uh, non-Quranic manuscripts. Uh, now, the Quran, Quran manuscripts of the 17th uh, century to the early 19th century uh, host dozens of Arabic tafsir sources that testify to rich exegetical tradition going back many centuries. So just to show you the wealth of the uh, exposure to of, uh, Arabic lit literacy, religious uh, studies, tafsir studies at that time. Now, uh, in oral, uh, the uh, Arabic, uh, the old Kanembu uh, was, is no longer used in the manuscripts of the Quran, but it uh, survives in oral recitations. And the old Kanembu language that we see in the manuscripts survived, uh, is known now as Tarjumo. The term uh, used by the modern day ulama, 
uh, in reference to the exegetical language they use not currently. Uh, uh, and this Tarjumo language derives directly from Old Kanembu. So when I say Old Kanembu and Tarjumo, I refer to a uh, linguistic uh, dialect, linguistic variety, uh, which is connected uh, and constitutes a special uh, single entity. Uh, Tarjumo is formally acquired and used among the speakers of Kanuri and Kanembu uh, when they study Arabic grammar, when uh, they uh, perform uh, ceremonial bilingual recitations of the Quran and other Arabic texts. And since this uh, old Kanembu Tarjumo uh, code or mm, variety is uh, very specialized, it is not intelligible to the untrained uh, Kanuri speakers. And importantly, it does not have any independent composition as far as we know. So it's only uh, all Kanembu Tarjumo only applies to the, uh, uh, in the sphere of the commentaries translation of the Arabic text. Let's briefly uh, look at uh, how old Tanembu works. Uh, and uh, here on this slide, for example, you can uh, see a passage from uh, Al-Baqarah. And uh, what I highlighted here is the old Kanembu devices to indicate subject, object, and uh, in direct object. So for example, uh, for Musa, Qala, Qala Musa, uh, Musa is the subject file, and it is indicated here by the uh, uh, suffix or clitic in Old Kanembu, which is here. And uh, uh, Old Kanembu can also be used and very often is used not only to show grammatical relations, subject, object, but also to translate uh, full passages. Uh, shown here, and I don't have time to go in any depth here. Only one thing that I wanted to uh, draw your attention at this point is this um, a phrase in uh, Minkum, which is translated here into Kanembu by the suffix or clitic Kami. And I will come to this point after the, my interim conclusion, which I wanted to offer right now. So, Old Kanembu Tarjumu is very different from any spoken dialects. Only can it can only be used in relationship with Arabic. It never exists in independent composition. And uh, Old Kanembu and Tarjumu have influence on lexicon in Kanembu and Kanuri. Some influence on phonology, how the sounds are pronounced, but we, there is no evidence for grammatical evidence of old Kanembu onto the spoken languages. And when we look at the modern day poetic registers used in, uh, all, uh, in um, Kanuri and Kanembu, we don't have any uh, traces of old Kanembu grammatical, uh, grammatical structures. Uh, nevertheless, some grammatical features of old Kanembu have been attested in one Kanembu poem, poem to which I will now uh, turn my second uh, part of the presentation. But before that, I'd like you to again, uh, I'd like to show you again a uh, page from, the, uh, from a Quran manuscript with the Old Kanembu translation, where you can see that uh, the uh, preposition, Arabic preposition min from is translated by the uh, uh, Clitic or suffix uh, kan here. And uh, here on another, mm, in another example, uh, you have another uh, clitic or another suffix, which I already showed to you, kami, also used with the preposition mean, but in reference to uh, a part of a whole. So from within, from among something. Now, uh, some time ago, in, in Chad, in Mao, where a Kanembu variety 
spoken Mao variety uh, spoken. There was a manuscript found, uh, which is uh, this. And this is a poem in Muhammad's genre. Uh, in Kanembu, in Kanuri, it is called Kalia or Kagalia uh, genre uh, in typical Wal um, uh, uh, type of texts. And uh, this is a uh, short, uh, relatively short manuscripts about uh, four folios. And uh, well, some of the uh, lines are translated here, come woman and take advice, unplate your uh, head, etc., etc. And uh, in one of the uh, parts here, uh, in, in, at the bottom line, you can see uh, that there is a uh, something that uh, strikes, uh, um, uh, that draws our attention specifically as a form of uh, non kanembu language. So this poem is written in a Kanembu variety and we don't see much, uh, we almost don't see, we don't see any uh, specific unintelligible to Kanembu speakers grammatical uh, structures that we see in old Kanembu or Tarjumo. But sometimes, and this, this poem, uh, poem shows this, is we do see our uh, particles, our clitics. So for example, here from your Lord, Kmanum uh, Khan. So we have this Khan, have Khan, this particle Khan, as we see in uh, Old Kanembu. It's not part of Kanembu language, of modern Kanembu language, but it is part of this manuscript. Now, also here, you can see the, the other particle, Kami, from within a land, Kirge Kami, in Kanembu. Kirge is Kanembu, but Kami is not part of Kanembu. It's, it is part of uh, old Kanembu. So here our uh, unique, evidence for the influence of old Kanembu on the spoken languages. And uh, uh, I'm now coming to uh, my uh, summary and conclusions uh, at the end of which there will be a big question mark. So old Kanembu in Tarjumo is a highly specialized linguistic variety and exclusively used for uh, translational purposes in interpretation of the Quran translation of uh, literal translation of the Arabic texts. It, Old Kanembu and Tarjumo are never used in independent composition. And we never see uh, influence on spoken dialects uh, or in religious poetry as we know, uh, as, uh, as we know now uh, that exists in Kanuri and Kanembu. So why that, uh, this uh, poem that we just saw exhibit all Kanembu features? And uh, a, uh, there is a hypothesis that I would like to uh, share is that because of the uh, various sociopolitical factors that occurred uh, along the line of the uh, 19th century, uh, something happened with the process of uh, establishment of a poetic register that would have been developed into a proper independent poetic uh, uh, variety, but it never happened because, uh, or because around this time there were major disruptions in so, so, socio-political uh, history of uh, uh, Borno. As I uh, mentioned at the beginning, uh, there were uh, uh, all the, um, the, uh, the Bo Borno uh, rulers, when they moved to uh, Berniga Zargamu in the 15th century, they brought all the uh, ulama came with them. And at the time of the control of dominance of Borno around the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, 
Canuri speaking uh, ulama were very much influenced in, in, in uh, very much influential across the whole uh, region where subsequently later um, uh, Sokota Caliphate uh, became a powerful uh, a power that controlled the whole region. So when uh, Sheikh al Kanemi uh, came to the scene, the influence of Kanuri speaking scholars who were masters of old Kanembu and Tarjimur, their influence uh, was became gradually uh, reduced. And uh, with the uh, disaster of uh, uh, Rabi Zubair and with the separation of uh, former, with the fall of the former dynasty, uh, Saifava dynasty, with the establishment of new dynasty, uh, the influence of the uh, old, uh, old Kanembu and Tarjimur was reduced to, to the pockets of the what became later well, Borno, Borno province. So somewhere uh, around this time, uh, there were po poems as demonstrated in, in, as I tried to show you in this presentation, there were poems that did show uh, the connection between the um, poetic register and the old uh, Kanembo. But after that point, we have no traces of that. And uh, only the uh, discovery of uh, further uh, manuscripts of this type uh, can uh, prove uh, the, uh, this hypothesis that in this particular manuscript, we deal with a special poetic register that is now extinct. So on this note, I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dimitri uh, Bondarev, for this uh, fascinating uh, excursion into uh, into the transitions that we may see, and, and especially for leaving us with uh, such an intriguing question at the end. I hope we can return to that at the Q&A session towards the end. I remind the audience that there will be a Q&A session towards the end. But before that, I am also honored to introduce our third speakers in this case because it will be a joint presentation uh, between Professor Muhammad Muamzandi and Professor Samba Kamara. Uh, Professor Muamzandi is a specialist of Af African, linguistics, African linguistics and African Islamic societies, cultures and literatures uh, at the University of North Carolina. And he has published several journal articles focusing on linguistics, literature, and Islamist violent extremism. Professor Komara is a specialist of West African oral traditions and literature, and his research has investigated the crossroads of the religious and the profane in uh, Black Islamic African popular cultures. He's currently working on a monograph stemming from his doctoral dissertation, which is tentatively entitled Recording Postcolonial Nationhood, Islam and Popular Music in Senegal. Uh, Professor Mwamzandi and Professor Kamara are the principal and co-principal respectively on a new uh, endangered archives project known as EAP 1245, uh, which regards the digitizing of uh, the archives of the Tal families, which is uh, the one we will hear about in this presentation. So you are most welcome and the floor is yours, however you divide it between yourself. Hey, thank you, Bang, for that uh, introduction. I will straight go to the presentation, which I'm presenting together with Dr. Samba Kamara. And as mentioned, we are from the University of North Carolina, uh, and in Chapel Hill. And uh, we are teaching in the Department of African, African American and Diaspora Studies. Next. So, 
Next. Uh, first, we want to acknowledge the Endangered Archive Program, British Library, with the major grant, EAP 1245, and also the West African Research Center in Senegal, who are our local partners there, and the African Studies Center at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill and also the host department for the logistics and also helping us in the in this project next so i would very first say in this uh, section of presentation i'm mainly focusing on what we did and how we accomplished the project and here we were in 2021, we were at work, the West African Research Center in Senegal, Dakar. And uh, we are here with the director of work, Dr. Osman Sene, and also the digitization expert, uh, Kari Bannon, that you see here at the West African Research Center. Next. So as the first Senegalese to massively embrace Islam, the Halpular, also known as Fulani, Fula, have used Arabic and Pula Ajami for centuries. These texts were written by local Islamic authors affiliated with the West African branch of Tijaniya Muslim Brotherhood, pioneered by, in Senegal by Al Hajj Omar Tal, and spread by his descendants and followers in Senegal and southwestern Mali. The project digitized a total of over 6,000 pages of text in Senegal and Mali based on the Endangered Archive Program British Library Guidelines who, have provided, who provided funds to cover some of the costs of the project. Next. So here, the, before we started the project, we held a workshop in Senegal and this workshop was held in October 19, 2019. We, the main uh, purpose of this uh, workshop was to meet first our, our local partners at the West African Research Center and also the manuscript holders. We also trained the research assistants during this workshop. Next. We mainly digitized the three collections. The three collections, one, was uh, the Charno Madani Taos collection, who had uh, two of the collections, Charno Madani Taos collection of manuscripts from Senegal and Charno Madani Taos collection of manuscripts from Mali. And the third collection was Muntaga Bas collection from Pategalo in Senegal. Next. So here we were at the Cherno Madani's residence and mosque and also library in Dakar, Senegal. And we were mainly meeting with uh, Cherno Madani's assistant, Ibrahim Masi, who handed over the manuscripts to us. So that is me. Okay. And then uh, the Cherno Madani's collection in Senegal. Charno Madani Charles collection from Senegal includes eight unbounded and bound manuscripts for a total of 2,949 pages. Some manuscripts are originals written by Al Hajj Omar Chal or hand copied by his Sufi disciples. Other manuscripts are handwritten copies of books originally authored by Arab scholars, such as Muhammad Ibn Muhammad Al Masri. In the 18th and early 19th century, Al Hajj Umar Tal and his descendants would hand copy manuscripts whenever he wanted or they wanted to, co to carry a copy of a newly encountered text. During this time, there were no printed texts in the West African area, Senegal and Mali. Next. Charno Madani Tal is the current custodian of the manuscripts recorded in his name and collected in Konyakari in Mali. The Madani Mali collection includes three unbound and bound manuscripts for a total of 1,545 pages. The books are of different sizes. All the manuscripts are originals written by Al Hajj Umar Tal, except one. The one manuscript is handwritten copy of an original written by an Arabic scholar. Next. 
And then I will talk about the Muntagia Bar's collection in Senegal. Muntagia Bar is the current custodian of the manuscripts collected from the town of Bategano, northern Senegal, near Mauritania. The collection includes over 20 unbound and bound small book manuscripts and several paper stacks. Paper stacks contain each a mixture of praise poems and correspondences. The letters were written and or received during various religious and secular occasions. Next. Oh, here we were at Muntaga Bar's residence at Pategalo. Muntaga Bar's residence is, the, is in the Futa Toro region in Pategalo. And uh, it is important to mention here that it is near Halwar, the hometown of Al Hajj Omar Tal. Next. Muntagia's Bar's collection consists of uh, the authors, the 12 book manuscripts and one of the paper stacks were composed by Muhammad al Ghaliba, who died in 1991 of Pategalo. al Ghaliba wrote several manuscripts and reports during his many travels to different places in West Africa and the Arab world. And the rest of the collection is authored by Mamadou Lamin Ach, Sal Ahmed al Ha. Al Hajj, Abu Bakr C, Omar C, Hamma C, Hammeba, and Muntagaba. Next. The material is mostly composed of panegyric style, which includes Islamic history and instruction, Prophet Muhammad's life and importance, the lives of several Muslim saints from West Africa and elsewhere. And also, there were some mystical documents that uh, many of these. Uh, a manuscript holders were not willing to share with the world somehow. Next. So I, I would finalize my section by saying that Tijaniya practices are very alive and evident in Pategalo and also in Senegal. And here Muntagaba and family is performing a poem on the history of Prophet Muhammad. And uh, also Tijaniya liturgies chants and uh, recitations of casidas can be heard as one passes by the streets of Pategale and also in Senegal, especially in the evening. Uh, Dr. Samba Kamara, please proceed. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mumzandi or Mwali Mumzandi. Uh, thank you again, everyone. So, I just wanted to take us, uh, you know, into a, a dive into the manuscripts very quickly. And uh, the samples that I would like to share include Safina, uh, Rima, Jawahir, uh, not Jawahir al Maani, but Jawahir Wadura, and a few Ajam texts. And what we call here Ajam, it's the name that the Pular speaking folks who authored these manuscripts have for Ajami uh, manuscripts. So there are various stylistic traits that we can use to categorize these manuscripts. But uh, here we've focused on the mediums of writing. Uh, and uh, the, there are two mediums that we came across. So there's what you call daha uh, and uh, pen, right? Um, so daha is more of a traditional uh, ink, a homemade ink, which is common in many uh, West African Muslim societies. Um, and the pen would be more of a modernization of that tradition, uh, Daha based tradition of Islamic knowledge production uh, or Islamic scholarship in West Africa. So then the two, based on this aesthetic sort of traits, we ended up with two categories. So Daha on paper, right, um, uh, as the first category, which basically uh, includes uh, material, you know, um, spanning the period of 1840s, uh, you know, uh, until, you know, the 1970s. Uh, so I'm providing here a, a picture to give you an idea of, you know, how uses of, of that ink uh, is still uh, relevant and alive. So, um, Daha can be used for composing uh, lines on the wooden slate 
or also on paper. So uh, many of our inter interviewees who are also custodians of this manuscript uh, reported to us that al Hajjumar Tal himself had used Daha to compose uh, you know, his signature uh, Tijanya texts such as um, um, Rima, which was composed, you know, around 1815, right? And and Safin of the Saadat, which is also composed around 1863. So then that tells us a lot about the history uh, in the use of Daha. So we found um, Daha-based uh, manuscripts in, in, in Senegal, in Dakar, but also in Kunakai, in southwestern Mali. So the first sample that I'm using here, again, we are being very selective because each one of these manuscripts has something to be said about in it. Uh, but, but here, uh, this is a piece from uh, Saifin of the Sadat, which you know, uh, is uh, 312 pages. Um, this is not the original Saifin of the Sadat, which al Hajjumar al had composed with his own hand. Instead, uh, and you know, some of you may be aware of what happened in, 18, in 1890 when uh, the French Lieutenant Colonel, uh, after they took over Segu, they captured the whole library and then shipped it over to Paris. So the entire library was looted. And to this date, we haven't been able to, rec to recover it. So recently they, they digitized it, you know, and then threw it on the internet, added a lot of stamps, uh, additional archival stuff, which was not a part of the original manuscript. So I think that was just a parenthesis. So the, the original that you're looking at here and which we had digitized was composed, was hand copied by one of Omar Tal's followers who had gone with him in jihad. So um, his name, his nickname or his, his second name is uh, Dembarabi and his full name is Sheikh Ahmed Njai from uh, the town of um, Jum. So uh, you will see some red ink Daha here, uh, which again speaks to various techniques that these folks had to, to have at least red and green color, uh, you know, uh, with, with the black. So uh, um, uh, again, uh, this is a manuscript, you know, uh, it's a copy, as I said earlier. Um, and al Hajj Martal uh, does state in the text that uh, his reading of uh, Arab authors, uh, there are many, but we can name uh, Sheikh Abu Zaid, Yahya ibn Yahya Laithi al Andalusi, uh, had really influenced his composition of this manuscript. And um, even when we look at the uh, manuscripts digitized by the French National Library, we do see these Arab texts in as part of his library. So, so he, the influence is, is very clear. It's very clear and it is, it is there. Um, this is a piece, um, uh, an excerpt from uh, al Rima, uh, which, which is a 513-page manuscript, um, uh, that hardcover binding, uh, handmade, uh, with black ink, of course, uh, fading on some pages. And, uh, he also, uh, there is the, the famous uh, circular diagram representing the stages, the stations that, the, 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 uh, 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 that are very common in, uh, you know, uh, Sufi, uh, in, in understandings of the Sufi path of, of, of um, uh, progress into the Sufi path. Uh, so um, uh, the text also does name these cities uh, that you can see on the slide. Uh, which traces the geographies of al Hajj Martal's travels, um, uh, not just in West Africa, but also in North Africa and parts of the Middle East. So this is a manuscript that contains 55 um, sections or parts. Um, the original was composed in uh, 1815. Uh, and Rima, as uh, we can see, it's one of Omar Tal's very much coded text. Even the, the year of its publication, of, of, of its completion is actually coded in the next page that I'm going to show you where he uses some Arabic numerological formula to tell us uh, basically when he completed it. But after we did some uh, math, we came up with the year 1815 um, uh, here. So, um, that is it with, with Rima. And maybe I should just add that it's a comment, it's 
Omar Tal's commentary on uh, Jawahir al-Ma'ani, which is composed by uh, Ali Harazim, uh, which is basically a collection of teachings of uh, the founder of the Tijani Sufi order, uh, uh, Ahmed al-Tijani. So um, a quick jump to the next sample that I want to share, um, which is a more recent uh, manuscript composed by al Haj Martal's grandson. Uh, and this is a larger uh, manuscript of 560 pages, uh, unbound. Um, it is clearly legible, uh, but of course, this is an old, uh, this is a text from a very old process of writing, which took 40 years of documentation, you know, between Senegal and Egypt, uh, but also uh, in other parts of, uh, of, of, of West Africa uh, as well. So, um, mentions of the cities, uh, cities that I mentioned in the text include Sokoto, um, uh, Kai, uh, Nyoro, etc. Um, and those also speak to El Haja Martel's um, um, geography in that, in that region. So, uh, the other page uh, that I have here is also from Jawahir Wadural. Uh, which is composed by Muntagatal, um, as I mentioned earlier. And um, it is a text which, take, which took 40 years. Uh, and um, it elaborates basically on Omar Tal's unique life achievements, you know, his uh, upbringing. Uh, and, and I think this text was mostly, uh, as Tiano Madani emphasized, uh, was an attempt to produce a, a, a biography about al Haj Martel, uh, which would come from the perspective of his, his descendants. Uh, and of course, you know, al Haj Martel is a very controversial figure in African history, uh, specifically in West Africa. So there was an attempt uh, to, to sort of produce a narrative, um, uh, uh, an internally perceived narrative uh, about, Sheikh, uh, about the Sheikh. About the Sheikh. So the second category is the pen and paper ones. Um, uh, and I must emphasize that these two categories, they are not clearly, uh, not, there's not a clear cut boundary between them. They, they, there's a lot of overlapping, um, but uh, starting in the 1960s, um, from what we have collected at least, uh, you know, began the use of pen, right? Um, uh, you know, in composing these uh, uh, manuscripts, mostly Ajam manuscripts. So that's the move from Daha to, to Penn, uh, you know, and we encountered manuscripts of that kind in Dakar, but also uh, mostly in Patigal. So the first sample that I have here to share is a, a, an Ajam poem by um, Muhammad al Ba, which is composed uh, around 1970. Some of these will show clearly the date uh, of the completion of the manuscript. Sometimes they won't, they won't. And then we have to use other uh, archival um, traits to approximate the date. Um, it, 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 the poem reads like a Ghazal uh, style poetry in its emphasis on the female figure. Uh, and it, it praises, uh, you know, uh, Sufi seclusion as a practice of uh, you know, as, as a path of knowledge acquisition, uh, so to speak. So, and the language again here is uh, Pular Ajam, and the title is uh, Kama, which literally can be translated as uh, saddle up uh, or get your horse ready, uh, basically. So, um, another uh, sample that I have here is from Muntagaba's collection, uh, one called La Hurokien. Uh, you can see the English translation there. Uh, so on, my, on the right hand side is one poem, um, um, and on the left hand side is you know the beginning of another poem. So basically, two samples of two different uh, poems. So um, these are all uh, panegyric style uh, poems uh, or qasida, if you will, uh, about Prophet Muhammad, and um, of course emphasizing uh, the unique uh, character of uh, Muslim identity. Which is very much praised in this in this in these poems. So the author of um, uh, the first poem is Hamasi, and the author of the second is Hame uh, Ba, uh, whom my colleague Mamzani mentioned earlier. So 
but what's very interesting about these manuscripts is that um, the, the, the authors of these, of these copies, they're not the actual uh, uh, authors who produced the originals. So basically they had copied from pre-existing text. And, and that brought a lot of questions around the, the issue of authorship. So we, we asked them a lot of questions and, and they seemed to be, they seemed not to be concerned with issues of copyright. So basically one could borrow from wherever you want and then you, you intertextually mix that with your current uh, uh, composition and produce a new poem. So, which is something very interesting um, that we thought. Um, so the last item sample that I wanted to share is a poem by Omar C. This time around, this is his original poem, which he uh, uh, crafted from his own. Uh, and this dates back to 1995. And um, it is a, a, a poem uh, that praises both uh, uh, Fatima al-Batul, uh, and it emphasizes al-Batul as an epithet, uh, you know, that, that, that sort of uh, is often used to characterize um, uh, Fatima as the separated, uh, as the, the woman who has attained that status of male sainthood, so to speak. Uh, and uh, it is a poem that is very much loved by these folks. So, they sing it on television, you know, uh, they sing it during those nightly uh, Vic um, um, performances. And uh, uh, it, it is a very, a very popular poem by Omar C. Um, but pen on paper manuscripts are not just a jam. Some of them also are Arabic as well. So what you, what, this is a sample where we Professor, have a Bible. Professor. Kamara, I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I'm just saying you have passed the 20 minutes. So okay. I will ask you to maybe make it more difficult for the interpreters and, and speak more uh, quickly. Sorry for that. Sorry. Please, please go ahead. That, that's fine, that's fine, sorry. Uh, so uh, in conclusion, um, all these manuscripts, you know, uh, they are authored by uh, followers of Ahosu Maktal, uh, 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 either genealogically or spiritually. Um, so while Arabization among half blood authors preceded Adamization, and by Adamization, we, we just mean to emphasize the shift from Arabic to uh, you know, um, writing in local languages, of course, using the Arabic script. Uh, so it is uh, those, these two systems of writing came to coexist. Um, so half blood Arabic manuscripts are still more numerous than the Ajami sources in, in, in Futa. Uh, they cover a broad spectrum of topics, you know, science, Islamic science, exegesis, Sufism, etc. Uh, but we noticed a lack of consensus, um, which may speak to Senegal's language policy itself. Uh, but Ajami panegyrics are widely memorized, performed, and remain most popular in Futa today. They continue to compose. Uh, and very interestingly, they are trying to Latinize their alphabet, I mean, their, their manuscripts, which is something very interesting. And I would, I would like to stop there. Uh, thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Professors uh, Mamzandi and Kamara for this insight into the, the Tal collection, both the process of working with it and uh, the insight to its contents. I'm also looking forward to uh, further discussion of this in the Q&A session. Uh, but uh, before we get there, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, our fourth and last speaker of today, uh, Professor Amidu Ulalkan Sani, who is Professor of African and Middle Eastern Studies at uh, Fountain University in Nigeria. He uh, taught for a long time at Lagos State University from 1984 to 2018. And his research interests cover literally, literary and linguistic studies and West African manuscript studies. He has won a number of awards, uh, including the British Commonwealth Scholarships and uh, Humboldt Fellowship, the Leiden Scaliger Fellowship and also Scheveninger Fellowship at uh, Oxford Center for Islamic Studies. He's participated in many international conferences and has served as, as a visiting professor at a number of international universities. 
Uh, Professor Sunny is also fellow at the Royal Asiatic Society uh, in Great Britain and the British Society uh, for Middle Eastern Studies. Uh, he has uh, over 200 publications, uh, books, journals, articles, book reviews, both in Arabic and in English. Uh, among his latest publications uh, is, uh, is entitled Islamic Historical Sources, Manuscripts and Online for the Oxford Research Encyclopedia. Uh, Professor Sunny, we welcome your presentation and I understand that this will be actually shown from, uh, from the organizers, but I hope that we will be able to both hear and uh, hopefully also see you during the presentation. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope I'm, uh, I can be heard loud and clear out there. Uh, if that is correct. Uh, Absolutely, I want to we thank hear you. The, so I want to thank the organizers uh, who have done a very wonderful job. And I want to commend all those who have actually uh, talked since yesterday. Well, uh, this presentation is part of a larger project. Uh, for quite some time, I've been working on a number on the uh, Yoruba Ajami. And I think the next slide will show you where, what, where is the Yoruba, where they are. So this is the map of Nigeria showing the major towns. And here, you, where you have that blue Niger, uh, River Niger, to the left of Niger, um, it's, it's where we call the Yoruba land. We have Loring, the Bumashaw, and stuff like that. So that is where the Yoruba people uh, are. Uh, next slide will also show you that uh, the linguistic groups of Nigeria, now where yeah, you have that one here, at least you can see the Yoruba and that uh, bright color. So we have, have Yoruba, they are the second largest ethnic group in, in the country. And the next slide will show you that uh, the, yeah, these are the African languages in which Yoruba is spoken, or, or in which Yoruba, uh, in which use uh, the Arabic script. You can see the number of languages. And of course, since this one came out in 2013, other African languages which using Arabic script have equally been discovered. And the next slide will show you that uh, the Yoruba language, yeah, before I go further on this particular one, this is the oldest documented Yoruba Qasida, which follows the Arabic type of, uh, the, of the, the rhyming type, you know, the Qasida rhyming in Ra. And you can see the influence of the Arabic Qasida here in, uh, in, in Nigeria, particularly among the Yoruba. But the earliest reference to Yoruba in Arabic source is probably by Ahmed Baba, a Tibetan historian, in his work called Muruju Saud, Yaraju Saud, which was completed in 1613, where he mentioned the Yoruba. And of course, we, it's my interest to know that the first translation of the Quran into any African language in 1906 was in Yoruba language. And of course, there's also the reference that a 17th century historical work about the history of Yoruba was actually done in Yoruba Ajami as using Arabic character and that the language was Yoruba. So that shows you the extent or the historicity of the Yoruba Ajami in the scheme of things, having a history of about three centuries behind it. Now, this one you have seen is the oldest uh, Pasida or poetry in Yoruba Ajami and uh, authored by someone who died around 1890 or thereabout, according to Honwick the Arabic literature of Africa series. Now, my choice of the topic between the secret and the profane is to show you that the original intent and use of uh, Yoruba Qasida is actually in the realm of religion, which I've called the secret domain. And you probably have seen yesterday when the uh, Bilhija, Bilhija, the lady, Dalia Bilhija, I think, who was talking to us yesterday, uh, talked about the use of uh, uh, the, the, the Pasida for religious purposes. And that equally conforms, confirms what has been uh, happening uh, in the Yoruba context. So, and it might also interest you to know that apart from this one, I've since discovered, even after this presentation, that 
the Yoruba in the United States or those enslaved in America or those in Brazil, they have actually maintained a culture of Yoruba Ajami from late 18th century to the early 19th century. Just to show you that the history of uh, Yoruba Ajami has been very, very wide. The other thing we need to know is what I've called multilingual Ajami. Uh, for those who had lived in Brazil, for example, uh, who still could uh, master some aspect of Yoruba. So they were able to also use the language of the people the, uh, of, the, of Bahia, so to say. And so that shows that the multilingual Ajami, Yoruba Ajami, has become widespread since the 18th or early 19th century. So and the next slide will also show you that this writing, this particular writing, uh, of course, you can see that the, the, the writer, you can see the script. Yeah, yeah, of course, the script, Arabic script or Yoruba script uh, in, in Ajami, among the Yoruba, is a, is, is a blend of uh, Maghribi, Kanawi, Sahrawi, depending upon the variety of script cultures to which this authors have been exposed. And that is, shows you that the, 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 the kind of latitude they've had in using the various uh, script that was available to them. And this particular one that I'm showing you now is, was copied by the great grandson of the author, uh, the man who died, Abu Wahab, who died some 10 years ago. So the next uh, slide will show you as well the character or the content uh, see another hand, is, uh, another hand of Yoruba Ajami, Yoruba poetry in, in Ajami, it can be seen here. And so it's, was, it's about, uh, it's gotten from uh, uh, Abdul Rahim Hamza. It's another codex of the, of the, of the, of the manuscript. And it's a manuscript and Ajami poetry in the Yoruba language, but in Arabic script. So it's a, a work on admonition, what we call waka. Waka means simply means song or poetry in the Hausa Yoruba tradition. Next one. Next slide, please. The next slide. Okay, why do we await for the next slide? Well, now, this particular one is also uh, a Yoruba ajame, which was copied in what I call the Oriental Nasri by Stefan Rechmut who was in Illinois some 30 years ago, there are about. So just to show that the interest in Yoruba Ajami is not limited only to academics. Yes, I want to stop a little bit here. This particular one we are seeing is what I've called the profane aspect of what's called the Fuji Reggae. Now, of course, you know, Reggae is a Western uh, music. And you could now see some authors using a Yoruba Ajami to document Reggae tunes or what we call the local Fuji Reggae music. And the, the last one I just showed you. So, and, uh, so you can see that the interesting, uh, and that's more or less an exemplification of the, the profane, what I call the profane, of course, you know, the traditional attitude of Islam to poetry or to song. So if, uh, which was probably used in the realm of uh, religious admonition, preaching, theology, and things like that, has now come to be used for Fuji reggae music, you can see what that means. And interestingly, I can also tell you now, even now, you can see the use of Ajami among some Yoruba authors in poetry like uh, writing on condom, uh, what they, they call it, a grand pass balloon in the local palace. And of course, it, so you can see also several aspects of uh, uh, Ajami being used for things like medicinal prescription, uh, short stories, even prison accounts, prison notes. Of Ajami. So these are new things that are just coming on now. And I want to see the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, while we're still waiting for the next slide to come, it will be interesting to know that what I focus on largely now is about how to evolve a standard script uh, for Yoruba Ajami. That has not been the case for quite some time now. And uh, yeah, this is another form of uh, Yoruba Ajami, which is about uh, singing during Ramadan, those who go to Hajj, and uh, for its uh, condemning photography or drinking of wine and all those kind of things, particularly by those who have just arrived from pilgrimage to Mecca. This uh, kind of poetry is, uh, of course, Yoruba and German poetry 
is more or less popular in the rite of passage, marriages, uh, funerals, uh, housewarming ceremony, uh, so what I call the rite of passage. So, so next slide, please. So the effort to have a standardized orthography has been on for quite a while, and that is what I want to focus in this concluding part of my presentation. How is it that there has never been a standard orthography for Yoruba Ajami? And I think, uh, go, on to the, go on to the slide. I'm coming to those now. Now, now so this is one of the early attempts. So you can see higher Naktubu Logati Yoruba, the Ramzil Arabi. Let us write Yoruba language with Arabic letters. So this is one of them by one Ahmad Shah Abu Salam uh, from Malaysia to Sudan. He's tried to evolve a standard orthography, but his effort uh, did not fully fail, although he didn't succeed. Right. Next one. So I'm going, in what follows, I'm going to show you the various efforts as Yoruba as evolving a particular orthography for Yoruba Ajami. You can see that's one. Next one. This is still the same effort by Ahmed Abu Salam between 19 in the early 70s up to 19. But because his own dialect is not the standard Yoruba dialect, so it, it became problematic. Next one. Next slide. Yeah. Yeah, you can now see another one now. See, written there, Anjami. And see, you can see the introduction there, meaning write, uh, writing and reading become easy for whoever is prepared to learn this book and want to know it very well. So this, what you see there is an introduction to the book, uh, Manual on Ajami, which was done by, interestingly, by some Sufi leaders uh, who are more interested in using the Ajami to propagate their song to their, lit their literaries and things like that. Next one, the slide quickly. Yes, you can see all, now, the use of uh, letter or, or vowels or consonant, you can see that for particular uh, uh, phonemes that are not in Arabic language, there is this attempt to modernize or to modify the Latin letters to show to ensure that they, they have something. Uh, this next one, next one. So these are just samples of uh, letters in Ajami with uh, vowels and uh, consonants. Next one. Go on, go on. Go on. Yes, now these are samples of proverbs and conversation in Yoruba language, but written in Nasuki. Now you can now see that, apart from the traditional writing script, you can now see Ajami, Yoruba Ajami now has become a matter for Nasuki or standard printing press script now. And of course, you now even have stories Shots in Yoruba Ajami in printed Arabic script. Go on. And I can end with my recommendation. So these are the two key scholars in Nigerian or Yoruba scholarship of the last, the past hundred years. Uh, Adam Abdullah Irori, and of course, you have Sheikh Atamaluddin. The two become symbols of scholarship in modern Nigeria in the past 50 or more years, and they still remain very popular. So you can see something written about their life history now in Ajami now. Next one. Next one. Now, you can see from this one that Zawiya, you can see the people of Zawiya, the Sufi acolytes, was interested in using Ajami more in propagating their belief and faith and litanies and whatever. So, uh, go on. Yes, this is another one now. Uh, you can see that this is Abu Bakr Yusuf Rufai uh, trying to write Yoruba Ajami in modern style with video script as well. Go on. I can, I, you can see the day 1424, just about 20 years ago. It's this one. Go on. I want to show you now Tafsir. There has even been Tafsir, yes. Tafsir in Ajami. Yes, this is a Surat al Fatiha. Uh, a tafsir being done in Ajami, Yoruba Ajami. But the thing is that only those, the problem with this kind of effort is that anyone who cannot read proper Arabic in the first instance will not be able to access or even understand the Yoruba Ajami. So it will be a, of limited audience. And because there is a, a limited, uh, there's no standard orthography 
for the, for the youth language, it will be very difficult for it to be widely uh, uh, cultivated or even understood. Next one. Well, well, yes, well, in this particular something, what uh, the international effort at finding an orthography, start orthography for Yoruba language, I have listed those efforts here, but those efforts have not succeeded up to date for a variety of reasons, which I don't want to go into because of time. But as of now, there is no, as, as no standard orthography for Yoruba Ajami up to the moment. Next one. Well, this is just something that is it's not about Yoruba Ajami, but interestingly, I've come across some, uh, what I would call uh, multi or multilingual Ajami in Sudanese Africa. And this one is about uh, Hausa and Boronu. So this Hausa, what we call Ankanuri. So just to show that at this date of 19th century, so show the interest in Ajami, particularly in scripture, Christian scripture. It's been very, very common. And this is just sample from what you've seen in the next few slides as something I brought uh, to show that interest in either monolingual Ajami or multilingual Ajami have been on for quite a while. And the Christian missionary are very, very active in this area. And recently, yeah, I've come across even some Yoruba tafsir uh, in Ajami by Christian missionaries dating to the early parts of the 20th century. You can see St. Gospel in 1857 now in the house of Ajami. And uh, go on, please, and so I can run up quickly. So these are just uh, samples I've gotten, and not Yoruba Ajami, but uh, this uh, the Rail Khairat uh, with the intralineal. Uh, um, uh, something from a uh, go on. Well, something fascinating, yeah, yes, it is also. Bishara uh, Luca, that is a gospel according to St. Luke. In uh, I, I want to ask why should there be a, a house, a Holy Bible in House Ajami? Of course, you know, this is purely evangelical uh, conversion strategies among, in areas where Islam is predominantly, and of course, the interest in anything Arabic will uh, sort of inspire anyone that sees anything in Arabic to see, okay, yes, I'm quite interested to see what is it. So the Christian missionaries in Nigeria, particularly the, uh, in the last few years, have been trying to use uh, Ajami to go into the house of for different Muslim areas. One. Next one. Well, interestingly, I've also, yeah, this is uh, uh, the German Raihan Bonke making what is called fire crusade in Nigeria. And you can see his poster trying to, I mean, uh, the Ajami in 1991. And uh, interestingly, maybe to end this presentation, I've come across some uh, materials by Yoruba in the Dios, Brazil to be precise, uh, where you have, of course, you know, the slave trade of the 17th to the 19th century. Some of those who were actually educated, who are literate in uh, Arabic, I've come across uh, some of the Ajami materials in multiple languages. And of course, in this regard, uh, the Gunaike has done a wonderful job in this regard. And I think he has also published in this area about uh, Yoruba Ajami in the diaspora. And of course, there have also been some in the United States enslaved Muslims who are from the Yoruba country who had also written. And, and just recently, Jeffrey Einboden published his uh, Jefferson's uh, Fugitives uh, about the, uh, some manuscripts that were written by enslaved uh, Afro-Americans. Uh, Afro and of course, evidence of uh, Yoruba authors are not uh, particularly lacking. So I want to end with my recommendations, if you can flip to that now, so that, uh, as I said, this is just a part of an, a larger project. And I just want to end by giving specific recommendations that will be of interest to Asmir and the Chima uh, as well. So if you can flip to recommendations now, or if you cannot, I will read from my own something here. And then so that, uh, well, my recommendation is that uh, we, as a matter of fact, yes, that Nigerian Ajami studies in their curriculum. Well, of course, well, this one is a begging, use Ajami to beg in Northern Nigeria. Yeah, this is one of the manuscripts I was talking about from the uh, United States. Uh, written by enslaved Americans in the 
needs necessary. Yeah, this is my recommendation now that Nigerian tertiary institutions should incorporate academic studies in their curriculum in respect of uh, Yoruba, Hausa, Fulfude, Kanuri, and Nupi, among other Nigerian languages that have had an issue of academic tradition. Number two, there's need for a better coordination of efforts among local and international experts, projects, and organizations dealing with languages using the Arabic script. Well, I've called on ISESCO, TASIA, FAMP, CSM, SC, and others to please come up with activity to ensure that the agenda becomes a literary or an academic language. Then, thirdly, ASMIA and TIMA should assist in the establishment of what I call a Yoruba Ajami working group, which will embrace linguists, Arabic, and Yoruba authors to work on the various aspects of the uh, standard language orthography for which there are abundant materials in the Yoruba country. For trainings, workshops, seminars for African researchers and Yoruba Ajami scholars on various aspects of manuscriptology, as well as donation of equipment and facilities at institutional level. A lot of uh, Ajami materials are dying away now due to lack of preservation. So there's need for digitization and, of course, even to encourage graduate students to use them for studies up to PhD level so that we can have all this digitized and then they can serve as sources for new knowledge about Africa. And lastly, establish of a bilingual Yoruba Ajami, or what I call Yoruba periodical. Of course, we know a model of that, what we call the House of Gastia Traffic Kwabu, which was founded in 1939. It was a, 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 a periodical in both languages. And uh, so of course, once we are able to put a standardized something, please. I want to thank you very much for, for, for listening to this presentation, and I look forward to your comments and observations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sunny, for giving us the history and, and the wide use of Yoruba Ajami, and especially all the interesting intellectual efforts towards uh, orthographic standardization, which is uh, a fascinating topic. Uh, we now have about 20 minutes left for questions, answers, comments. Uh, I encourage the audience to type their questions in the question and answer uh, section uh, uh, in the Zoom platform. Uh, I also want to remind you that actually the participants in the panel can also raise uh, questions and comments to each other, obviously. Uh, you can all see the questions, but just for the sake of, uh, of the recording, I, I, will read, uh, I will also read them briefly. Uh, the first question is uh, for uh, professors uh, Mwamzandi and Kamara regarding the Tal collection. Uh, there is a question uh, concerning the style of script in the in the samples that you showed, uh, whether it's more similar to Kanawi or Barnawi to use the typology of uh, Andrea Begaglia and Mauro Nobili, or if they are distinctive in their own right. That's a very uh, good question. Thank you. Uh... Uh, Professor Rees, um, but also a technical question. So I'm not very familiar with the Kanawi or Barnawi uh, uh, styles, but uh, most of the uh, most of the styles that you came across, either from Omar Charles text himself or from you know those we collected Futa uh, more recently, they are more in line with the Nashri uh, style. Now, uh, I may show you some pages and then they may also be different from the Nashri style because uh, it's just a lot of variations that these um, uh, authors are using. So uh, yeah, that's all I can say about that uh, for now. Or any other uh, persons in the panels in the, in the panel today who might uh, venture an opinion? Well, I, I, I want to ask a question if I'm allowed. Please. 
Well, I just want to find out that based on this our interaction now, is it possible for from this workshop to have a dedicated volume on Ajami, the Arabic literature of Africa series? So this would take care of Ajami materials across from North Africa, from East Africa, and then we can then see the, the areas of convergence or divergence in this Ajami tradition because it's getting wider these days now. The use of Ajami even for in political pamphleteering, advertisement, several other things like that. I mean, yeah, the new genres of literary writings. So I just want to put that maybe uh, Asmia or Tima or whatever I can think of that so can, part of the Allah series. Just an observation. So Anne may want to take note of that. So and probably that will come after the East Africa volume. Well, I think it's a very good suggestion and also one that would uh, require a wide, uh, a wide, how shall I say, collection of editors to, uh, to deal with all the Ajamis uh, on the African continent, but certainly something that could and perhaps should be done. Uh, I, I want to read a, a second question from uh, Scott Rees in Hamburg which is again directed to the, to the EIP project on the Tal collection uh, regarding whether these poems were, print, were copied using originals or if, or, or if these originals existed, were they then manuscript copies or were they printed copies? Or, uh, or rather, are, are they also circulating in print would be another phrasing. Very good question. Again, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 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 Scott, uh, for for missing uh, the, the third <laughs> question. Uh, and it is a very interesting one. So one of the uh, issues we encountered when we were uh, digitizing these manuscripts, uh, once we landed in Senegal, right, um, was to actually trace any possible link in the hand copy prints that you were looking at in Dakar, in Medina, to be specific, and the originals that Elijah Marshall, for example, might have produced. Because we know that, I know for sure that what we were looking at was not uh, his writings. If I compare that to, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the digital repository, of the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale Française. So we asked them questions. So how were they able to, to handwrite these copies? Because we were sure that they could not write it off of their head, right, of, of memory. So the explanation we received from uh, the custodians was that for ex Safina, for example, uh, and Riva were actually hand copied uh, before the library was taken uh, of uh, Ashina. So th these are basically hand these are uh, uh, hand copied uh, by uh, Omar Tal's followers, as I mentioned earlier, um, before 1864, right? Uh, uh, and also before 1890, which is basically the, the year when uh, the library was taken over. Um, now, regarding the Aja, the the the, the, uh, uh, the Pulat Ajami text. Um, Omar C. I showed you two samples of Ajam. One is by Omar C. The other one is by Hamasi. They told us that they copied these poems from memory because I mean people learn by heart in food, so it, you can easily write a lot of lines and then add your own in order to compose your new poem. Uh, so that's that's what I can say again regarding that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we actually do not have any questions uh, in our Q and A. Uh, oh yeah, there is one, uh, which is actually given in Arabic. Uh, is I please do. Mm 
Mm. Opposing, maybe. Mm. Are you there, Professor Sani? Yeah, oui, oui, oui. Should I maybe move on to to another question? And we can, uh, if we get contact uh, again, we will raise it again. Uh, there is a question here for Professor Mumuni on, on the online locations where the manuscripts can be viewed, which you showed. And if there is any uh, transcription projects going on at the moment. Professor Mumuni. Alors, par rapport à le, le catalogue numérique euh, sur les manuscrits, je sais que euh, mon collègue Broussal a travaillé pendant longtemps sur un catalogue de, de manuscrits en ligne. Et notamment, ils ont inséré pas un nombre important de manuscrits euh, subsahariens. Et, mais je ne sais pas si le projet continue, euh, mais je sais qu'il y a ce, ce projet qui a commencé il y a une dizaine d'années et qui est très, très important dans, euh, pour euh, permettre euh, à, à, aux chercheurs d'accéder au, au catalogue de, des manuscrits des collections. Et donc ça, c'est un catalogue numérique dont je la connaissance et dont je, de temps en temps, j'ai consulté. Voilà. Merci. C'est le seul projet que je connais en termes de catalogue numérique. Maintenant, je ne sais pas, euh, peut-être le collègue Dimitri, euh, aussi à leur niveau, euh, travaille dans ce sens parce qu'il euh, travaille beaucoup sur les catalogues, euh, enfin sur les manuscrits à Djami. Et peut-être il y a un début de, de projet sur, ces, sur les catalogues à, à Yami, catalogue numérique. Voilà. Merci. Dimitri, do, do you want to answer that? Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. My my internet connection is not strong now. Uh, yes, d directly to this question. Uh, yeah, thanks for 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 asking about the dig digital catalogs. We are now in the process of uh, uh, pulling together putting together a uh, large catalog of the Ajami material based on the collections in uh, in Mali in Malian libraries. So so far. Uh, we haven't published it yet, and we are we are working on the um, edition of the first publication of the uh, catalog, and uh, it will most likely be in digital and in printed version in Arabic and French. And so far, we've uh, identified in that catalog uh, that focuses on the Malian collection up to three thousand manuscripts. So. It's 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 uh, to come. This uh, well, we are looking forward ourselves to <laughs> to seeing the the results of uh, uh, one of our projects in Mali. 
and if I may, since I've given the voice, uh, may uh, I, I'd like to, I, I remember uh, someone asked about, ah yes, uh, Scott Rees asked about the Barnawi Kanawi uh, script. And so I, uh, since there was no uh, clarification, I'd like just to, to, to mention that uh, the Umar Talsk, uh, Talsk collection uh, uh, does not have any uh, traces of Barnavi or Kanavi script. So it's entirely a different family of scripts, very much related to the Sub-Saharan, uh, well, Sahelian uh, families, but on the other hand, very distinctive from the, uh, let's say, Central Sudanic lands. So it's, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there is one uh, manuscript in, uh, in Tal's collection, uh, which is a, uh, a Quran. And that one is in, uh, well, from, from, from Nigeria. So most likely it was brought uh, to, uh, to the, well, uh, to, to the um, Senegal, to the Senegambia lands uh, at, at that time. And we know that uh, the Barnavi Kanavi script was all, always, uh, um, particularly famous also in the 19th century. And we, we see a lot of uh, Qurans from the, uh, in Kanawi, Barnawi script in the Malian collections. So as evidence of the popularity of the Qurans copied in, uh, produced in the uh, Khan and Borno and Hausa lands. Thank you so much, Dimitri. We are almost at the end of our time, but uh, we have time for a few brief ones. Uh, a question for uh, uh, Professor Kamara, uh, whether you have worked at some point uh, with the manuscript uh, of Sheikh Musa Kamara in Senegal. Unmute, please. Thank you very much for the question, um, uh, Monsieur Drame. Um, I haven't, uh, unfortunately, but as you may know, my colleague at Duke, um, by law, uh, special, is a specialist of Sheikh Musa Kamara. Uh, I have recently worked together with him on a translation of uh, Sheikh Musa Kamara's biography about Sheikh Martal, but that's all I have done uh, so far. Uh, so, so he needed my, um, my pull out speaking skills. Uh, so uh, I'm not a specialist of, of Sheikh Omar Kamara with, with that expertise. Thank you. Okay, maybe if we can do the final question uh, in one minute, because uh, we are at three minutes left. Uh, again, for uh, Dr. Muhammad Ansamba, uh, did I understand correctly that you are cataloging these manuscripts based on whether they are written uh, with Daha or mm -hmm. a pen? Or how it, what has been your success in, in doing this division? Uh, I will let Mohammed probably speak, uh, <laughs> and then I will come second. Very good question. Yeah, the collections were mainly categorized according to the custodians. The, we just uh, did the division of Daha and Pain based on our own observation. But the categorization was mainly based on the custodians. That's what I would say. Excellent. Thanks. So we, we, are, we are currently working on, uh, so we just returned from a field trip in Senegal. And um, so we are still working on the metadata. And, and so the cataloging will definitely follow the EAP guidelines. Now, I think the aesthetics of Daha and Pen is an idea that came up because we have a plan of producing a paper about Sufi poetry in mm. Pular Ajami. And, and that is actually my, the, when I was writing on this, uh, the grant, the purpose was to answer two important questions. I'm not sure if my time will allow me to elaborate, but so uh, in Futa, we have the issue of modern slavery going on. And the unfortunate story is that Islamic narrative is being used as, um, some, some sorts of Islamic narratives are, are being used as the, 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 the rationale for that form of you know, um, 
social capitalization. So I was very much interested in gathering that literature that seems to inspire the oral stories about um, social hierarchy in Futa. So that's how it started. But I, as, as, as a scholar of um, um, uh, oral tradition in West Africa, I, I was also very much interested in the intertextuality between oral and written sources. So that's how it started. So the, the uh, Daha and Pen is just, you know, uh, an attempt mm -hmm. to uh, analyze the aesthetics of writing uh, in our future article, but it will not be determinant in cataloging uh, for the digitizing project itself. Thank you so much for, for the answer and, uh, and thank you to the audience for the questions. Uh, I'm sorry that we are in fact out of time now. So uh, there remains for me to say thank you to all the panelists for their very, very interesting and valuable contributions. And thank you to the audience for following. And uh, I will hand it back to the organizers for closing. Thank you so much. Uh, شكراً جزيلاً uh, Professor Peng على uh, هذه الإدارة الرائعة لهذه الجلسة uh, التي uh, استفدنا منها كثيراً حقيقةً والتي فتحت المجال لكثير من الأسئلة على مستوى المتابعين uh, وحتى على uh, مستوى uh, فريق التنظيم ها هنا ربما نأمل من خلال ما عرضتموه في أوراقكم البحثية في القريب العاجل ربما نأمل في أمرين الأمر الأول أن نرى كثيرا من الفهارس المختصة بالمخطوطات المكتوبة بالحرف العربي لأنكم كما تعلمون تظل المخطوطات مجهولة حتى يكشف عنها داخل فهارس منسقة ومنظمة تخرج عن المكتبات أو المراكز التراثية لتثبت إلى أي مدى تحتوي هذه المكتبات على نوادر أو على كثير من المخطوطات كذلك نأمل أن يكون هناك تنسيق بين المراكز الإفريقية المتنوعة لتوفير الجهد والوقت ربما يكون هناك مشروعات مشتركة ربما يكون هناك مشروعات قد تتكرر في بين مركزين أو ثلاثة لذا أتمنى في القريب أن ننسق هذه الجهود وأن نرى الكثير من الفهارس المرقمنة والورقية لما تحتويه المكتبات من مخطوطات مرة أخرى أتقدم بجزيل الشكر لبروفيسور بانك شكرا سيمو موني شكرا ديمتري بونداريب شكرا محمد موامزاندي شكرا سامبا كامارا وشكرا أميدو ساني على هذه الإضافات الرائعة نراكم بإذن الله تعالى في جلسة أخرى غدا في تمام الواحدة بتوقيت شرق أوروبا شكرا لحضراتكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته